Hello. Today I'm going to discuss composing a short story by using the elements of setting, dialogue, symbol, and conclusion. As examples, I'll be using Hills Like White Elephants by Hemingway and Miss Brill by Catherine Mansfield. One of the only ways, well, the only way to learn how to write a short story is to write a short story and to read lots of other short stories in order to get a sense for how to piece different elements together. Let's compare the way in which both stories open. Hills like white elephants. The hills across the valley of the Ebro were long and white. On this side, there was no shade and no trees, and the station was between two lines of rails in the sun. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and a curtain made of strings of bamboo beads hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. The American and the girl with him sat at the table in the shade outside the building. It was very hot and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. Immediately, it can be said that this is an objective story, right? It's difficult to argue that the hills are long and white. You could measure hills and you can tell what color they are. One of the only moments of any possible ambiguity about a debate is whether or not the shadows are war. That seems to be one of the few moments where you have an adjectival description in this statement. Otherwise, we simply have statements. We also get our characters. The American and the girl are sitting at a table in the shade, and that table is outside. We don't learn their names, right? So this is not going to be a story that's interested in them as individuals. Instead, it's interested in them in this moment. And we also have a sense of like a time limit, right? There's a train coming in 40 minutes. Compare Miss Brill. Although it was so brilliantly fine, the blue sky powdered with gold and great spots of light like white wine splashed over the Jardin Public, Miss Brill was glad that she had decided on her fur. The air was motionless, but when you opened your mouth, there was just a faint chill, like a chill from a glass of iced water before you sip. And now and again, a leaf came drifting from nowhere from the sky. Miss Brill put up her hand and touched her fur Dear little thing, it was nice to feel it again. Notice the strong contrast from Mansfield to Hemingway. Here, we suddenly have an enormous amount of poetic language. We have the blue sky powdered with gold and great spots of light, like white wine. Immediately, we're using extravagant language poetic devices, such as a simile here. And then we transition and we have the person's name, Miss Brill. And what do we learn about her? We learn that she's glad. And so we have a sense of interiority with Miss Brill. The narrator is capable of telling us what Miss Brill is feeling. So you had in the first, in Hills Like White Elephants, no sense of feeling. And here, Miss Brill immediately learned she's glad. And then we have a direct address to the reader, so inviting us into the familiarity, and another simile, and uh, then we get some uh, what's called free indirect discourse, but Miss Brill in her brain, in her mind, is thinking, dear little thing, and then we have the emotion, it was nice to feel it again, all right? So if you wanna practice setting, here are some exercises that you should think about. Think about where you want to set your story. Is it inside or outside? Will you move in the story? Like, will you go between different spaces? Will you write from the first person, I, second person, you, or third person, he, she, or they? Something else to consider is a point of view besides people. Try imagining the scene through the eyes of an object or an animal, a pet, a bird, your computer, book bag, anything like that. Do you want the story to seem objective, like with Hemingway, 
where there's no really debate about whether what the objects are, or subjective, like the Catherine Mansfield, where you have a sense of the interiority of the individuals, what they're feeling. Try to describe your surroundings or your setting in both ways. What feels right to you? Let's now compare some dialogue from Hills Like White Elephants. They look like white elephants, she said. I've never seen one. The dark man drank his beer. No, you wouldn't have. I might have, the man said. Just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. The girl looked at the bead curtain. They've painted something on it, she said. What does it say? Anas del Toro, it's a drink. Could we try it? Notice that there are no adverbial descriptions about how these characters are speaking. We simply learn, he said, he said, she said. The narrator is not giving us any hints if somebody is exasperated, happy, excited, disappointed. Instead, it's left completely up to the reader to try to guess at what these emotions might be. Compare the very small amount of dialogue that we have in Miss Brill, where the two characters, where Miss Brill overhears two people talking about her. No, not now, said the girl. Not here, I can't. But why? Because of that stupid old thing at the end there? Asked the boy. Why does she come here at all? Who wants her? Why doesn't she keep her silly old mug at home? It's her for her, which is so funny, giggled the girl. It's exactly like a fried whiting. Ah, be off with you, said the boy in an angry whisper. Then, tell me, mon petit cher. No, not here, said the girl, not yet. One of the things to point out specifically is uh, the fact that we have the girl giggling, but specifically the boy is going to say this phrase in a angry whisper. That use of angry tells us something about the emotion, right? That's an adjectival modif adverbial modifier. It tells us the emotion. Well, I do magic is. Um, angrily would be the adverb. So there's another way of differentiating those, right? What kind of speech indicators are you going to use? So an exercise for this. You will have to decide if you want to have dialogue, first of all, because you might not even want it. If you do though, here's a fun exercise. Record as randomly as possible, right? Just push the record button on your phone at any point during your day, a conversation you have with someone in your house. I guess you could record a phone call too. Listen to it a few hours later and try to provide a transcript. First, transcribe it with minimal markers of tone or emotion. Simply say, I said, he should. Just use said or asked. Then, Transcribe it with adverbial and adjectival markers. Use different speech verbs. Did somebody shout? Did somebody whisper? Give it a sense of the life that comes there, but it's also the perspective and that level of subjectivity. Okay, let's talk a little bit about symbols. Both of these stories have very strong symbolic objects. In Hills Like White Elephants, it's in the title, it's the white elephant, and in Miss Brill, it's the fur. So I'm sure you picked it up, but Hills Like White Elephants is, they're having a conversation, and it's not about white elephants. They're having a conversation about an abortion, but they're not talking about it. And so a white elephant, you might know, like a white elephant gift is a gift that's given that nobody wants, and it's obnoxious, and it's like the also becomes the elephant in the room. So this is a, entirely a story in which the man and the woman have a conversation about something that they are not talking about. And so you gain access to this through this idea of the white elephants, right? The hills like white elephants. So here's an exchange that they have. All right, I was trying. I said the mountains looked like white elephants. Wasn't that bright? That was bright. I wanted to try this new drink. That's all we do, isn't it? Look at things and try new drinks. I guess so. The girl looked across at the hills. They're lovely hills, she said. They don't really look like white elephants. I just meant the coloring of their skin through the trees. Should we have another drink? All right. 
The warm wind blew the bead curtain against the table. The beer's nice and cool, the man said. It's lovely, the girl said. So in this story, the girl's going to come to a conclusion about whether to have this abortion or not. One thing that she steps back from though, is she says, she takes herself away from that simile, from that poetic language. She started with, I, she was trying to be playful, right? I said the mountains looked like white elephants, it wasn't that bright, meaning like a light piece of conversation that showed her positive attitude. But then she backs up from that. They're lovely hills, they don't really look like white elephants. I just meant the coloring of their skin through the trees. So she still maintains a certain level of the poetic there by calling, by giving the hills skin, which I think is a very interesting idea, but she also keeps backing up and then they transition into having more drinks. So that's the other thing that happens through this story is they increasingly use alcohol in order to facilitate a discussion about this topic that they're not actually going to talk about. Compare this to the fur in Ms. Brill, where we also develop that symbol, that image. The first time we see it, Ms. Brill put, her, put up her hand and touched her fur. Dear little thing, it was nice to feel it again. She had taken it out of its box that afternoon, shaken out the moth powder, given it a good brush, and rubbed the life back into the dim little eyes. What has been happening to me, said the sad little eyes. Oh, how sweet it was to see them snap at her again from the red eider down. Here we have the, the fur is reanimated through Miss Brill's taking care of it. We also have the fur like talk because the sad little eyes are saying this thing. And we have the interiority of Miss Brill in which she enjoys seeing the, the eyes sparkle, right? So it's animated. This dead fur has been animated. Later on in that piece of dialogue, we hear the fur get made fun of. It's her fur, which is so funny, giggled the girl. It's exactly like a fried whiting. A whiting is a type of fish, right? And so the girl is using this other simile, which kind of reduces the animation out of the fur that Miss Brill was delighting in. And the last moment we see the fur is, the box the fur came out of was on the bed. She unclasped the necklet quickly, quickly, without looking, laid it inside. So the story began with bringing this fur out and reanimating it, and it ends with it going back into a box. Right? We almost have a life cycle of the fur here. This mimics the experience that Miss Brill is having, where she starts with excitement to go outside. She has this revelation of poetic language. Everything is a play, and I'm an actress, an agent in it. And then like stepping off stage with the realization of how other people see her, especially these two youths. So here's an exercise if you want to think about including a symbol. And I know this seems very mathematical, but I hope that you can discover some kind of organic process of creation. So a symbolic object can be an easy way to concentrate your central idea onto an external source. By imbuing an object with meaning, you give the reader an external manifestation of your inner feeling that you're trying to go for in the story. So for instance, if you want to talk about loneliness or solitary, um, a sense of solitary uh, isolation, anything like that, or my like, great joy, I don't know what you're going to go for. In this case, one thing to do is brainstorm a list of objects that have extra meaning to you now under these specific circumstances. You might consider your book bag which you likely no longer use, or your school ID. Are they slowly gathering dust? Do you find something inside the book bag that you had forgotten about? Is your sense of personal identity disassociating from your identity as a student as represented by your uh, ID? Anything like that. Just look around you and consider if an object around you can be imbued, be filled with meaning. And lastly, you want to consider the conclusion. Hills like white elephants. Do you feel better? He asked. I feel fine, she said. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. This is the only time in this story where there's been a discussion about feelings. And the woman expresses them in as bland of terms as possible. Fine. Right? It's, not a la it's not language of having made a decision either. And so you have to consider that. It's a point of great 
debate that you could engage in. Right? To end on this ambiguous note of I feel fine is just a declaration of uh, like health, first of all, and then <laughs> idiomatically um, just content. Right? So you might consider the blandness of that last word as indicative of a different sense of emotion that she likely has. So the, Hemingway ends a story on with dialogue. There, Mansfield. She sat there for a long time. The box that the fur came out of was on the bed. She unclasped the necklet quickly, quickly without looking, laid it inside. But when she put the lid on, she thought she heard something crying. So she thought she heard something crying. We've already had her connecting uh, herself with the fur, the animated fur. We've seen how she does that. She's glad the fur is snapping. There's kind of this animation. But in this last moment, what she's done is completely disassociated herself from herself, right? She now sees herself as a thing and she's the one crying. Miss Brill is the one crying, but she separates that emotion from herself in this act of disassociation. And so we don't end at all on dialogue. We instead end on a deep moment of interiority in which she's rendered herself exterior to herself. So here's an exercise, um, because your last words in your story will necessarily have a lasting impact on the reader because they're the last thing the reader will see. As such, you will wanna make it um, as specific as possible. So some people consider writing a story as rewinding it, that is like sort of, they're writing toward a specific ending. There are several authors that will that have talked about this and they say, John Irving is one that comes to mind. And so they say, oh, I have the last sentence in my head, and then I write to get to that sentence. So you might consider like, if a certain phrase or a, a sentence has popped into your head, maybe make that the last moment and try to write toward it. So some, an exercise to do is write down the endings from both of these stories and write toward those endings with your own story. How do you get to that same place, I feel fine, from your perspective of your short story about this period? Or how do you get to the sentence of something was crying? I hope this was helpful and I look forward to hearing how the process is going for you.